I'll give you some insight to what we're doing here at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, one of my roles here at UPMC also is to help to lead the strategy for telemedicine, and it's a very interesting time for us as well. Um, so with that, I'll start with Alex. We can come down the table here, and each one of us just introduce ourselves, where we're from, and what our role is with telemedicine, and then we'll go back to the end and, and then talk about it. My name is Alex Nason. I'm with Johns Hopkins Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm the Director of Telehealth Services. Um, actually, my responsibilities are really threefold. Number one is day-to-day um, -day telemedicine operations, helping physicians with great ideas, uh, trying to help them work with industry leaders, uh, technology companies to really engage and, and bring these ideas to, to fruition. Um, also, I direct and, and manage the e-learning platform for Johns Hopkins <coughs> Medicine. I'm responsible for training for 30,000 individuals, uh, compliance, safety, and uh, everything else responsible there. And then also my work with Johns Hopkins International uh, as well, and the outreach that we're doing not just within the U.S., but uh, also globally as well, which I'll talk about here in a few minutes. Hi, my name is Pramod Gaur. I'm from United Health Group. Uh, my title is Vice President of Telehealth for United Health Group. I'm a relatively new employee to United Health Group earlier this year. Prior to that, I spent 10 years in telemedicine field, uh, uh, creating a joint venture company with Bayer and Panasonic uh, called Viterian Telehealthcare, uh, running that as a president CEO. Then in 2007, <coughs> I started a, uh, another telehealth <coughs> company out of uh, Toronto, Canada called Health Anywhere. And uh, so I've uh, been in the field. Uh, part of the reason I've joined United Health Group is that in the last 10 years, as I saw the technology and, uh, uh, and a small pilot, then it kind of stops there and then say, who pays for it? And I say the best thing is the opportunity is to understand from the payer side as well. And so having a great time as far as trying to understand is United is a very large organization and we'll touch in a minute a little bit about the background, but I'm very uh, thankful to be invited here to, to share with you some of the thoughts. My name is John Moss. I'm with LifeWatch. Uh, it's a Chicago-based company, although I am a Pittsburgh native. I actually still live here. I just commute. Uh, we're uh, a telemedicine company in, in business. We've been in business uh, quite some time delivering probably one of the roots of uh, telemedicine, remote monitoring of uh, cardiac patients, starting with the halter monitors, uh, then the event monitors, and now telemetry. And now we moved into uh, home sleep testing. Uh, <coughs> the uh, the constant struggle is obviously, you know, what do you do about the business model because we're totally based on reimbursement. And uh, that every year it gets cut, that's not news. And so we, well, we have to figure out how to, how to survive, how to thrive. And uh, I came on board uh, about nine months ago because uh, I have a background in this, uh, this area for quite some time. And uh, my position there is the Vice President of uh, Marketing and Product Development. And uh, the, the problems this comp company had run into is uh, excellent engineers designing all kinds of devices and sensors <coughs> that can measure anything. There's nothing that technology can't do for medicine. The problem is that it has to be fundable. There has to be a business model around it. Uh, so I have to be very creative and look for devices or services. A product could also be a service that we can provide is that truly you know blends in with the needs and also can somehow be reimbursed or paid for in, in some some fashion uh, my, my I was a hospital administrator for five years and I, I knew that uh, remote medicine was going to uh, be big at one point in time because all we ever did was <coughs> talk about reduced length of stay and what, what we can do to get the patient out I knew lots of ways but and it's happened so I, I, I'm positioned now to do something about it. UPMC is a, uh, looking to engage telemedicine on an international front. We have a $200 million arm of our company. It's one of the four arms that is the International Commercial Services Divisions. Uh, we have uh, two hospitals. One's a PPP in Italy, and one we have a majority share of in Ireland right now. Uh, we have 1,500 full-time employees on the ground overseas. And that for us to sustain our activities, in Western Pennsylvania, um, as well as internationally, we have to learn how to do and practice very efficient and effective telemedicine. Um, <clears throat> at a much higher level, telemedicine is almost a dirty word these days, right? 
<laughs> We're supposed to call it, if you want to be sophisticated, you can call it telehealth. Mm -hmm. If you want to be European, you can call it e-health. If you want to be mystical, you can call it virtual care. <laughs> or if you want to be hip, you can call it telecare. But whatever it is, it's care we're not talking face to face. It depends on how you want to phrase it. Um, there's no doubt that telemedicine will turn into something like laparoscopy where it fades to the back and is a sort of part of medicine in the way that we do it. True telemedicine might be considered a phone call. We've been doing that for ages. It could be radiology which is actually the only space that we've really seen that private companies or companies are making money right now on a very large scale. Other companies are doing it now. We've got some other examples here. But a lot of the tertiaries are sort of rolling up their sleeves and about to jump into this situation head first. What we're seeing is that many people specialize in one form of telemedicine. Uh, we worked extensively with Glenn Hammock, um, Dr. Michael Davies, <coughs> excuse me, at the University of Texas Medical Branch. And they spun off a private company called New Physicia. We've actually been working hand in hand with them. Um, in their heyday, they did about five or 600,000 on a prison-based capitated system. Um, there was a seminal uh, report, um, there's a critical report that came out in uh, 2007 by AT&T that was funded by um, the partners organization AT&T, <clears throat> looking at telemedicine. A lot of the care and the savings in that situation were in transportation costs um, and some other cost savings as well. Um, there's another major telemedicine network that's up there in Toronto, the Ontario Telehealth Network. We're actually headed up there in a few weeks, run by um, Ed Brown. Right. They're about 95% live telemedicine, and they do 100,000 consults a year. Interestingly enough, they do not have any doctors. They're almost brokering telehealth in the cloud, so to speak. So we're seeing a lot of different forms of telehealth. There's pilot projects and home monitoring. We're seeing, um, like for congestive heart failure or diabetes management, we're seeing live, um, very large live telemedicine networks. But really, from a bigger picture, we have yet to see one major center crop up that does a lot of live, a lot of store and forward, and a lot of home monitoring. And this is what we need for the future of healthcare. So it'll be very interesting to see what others are doing in our own domains. And I'm glad that we're collaborating because um, as we laugh about the descriptions of telemedicine, we're all sort of nodding our heads. Sometimes it's a dirty word, sometimes it's a good word but most importantly, the patients, it's a word that they're going to want to use and want to hear.